Welcome back to the show, Dr. Jed Burton. Today, I think this episode's coming around and out around Halloween. What do you say, Luke? Spooky. Spooky. You're not dressed up. That's a little disappointing. Oh, but, man. Uh, but I, I, I have some orange on in my shirt. <laughs> you have the right colors, yeah. either for being a Cleveland Browns fan or for you know Cleveland. the fall festivities. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right away, I guess we could hop right into this. Is there evidence that these stories of vampires and werewolves is based in some truth? And when you're when we're looking back in the history, like where does this come from? And there's stories of hundreds of people getting killed by these. Some people just think it's all Hollywood and none of this stuff ever happened. Could you give us some historical context to these creatures? And um, we'll just hop right in. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern-day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Looking at the at pop culture, we get a constant barrage of movies about vampires, werewolves, mummies, and all kinds of you know classic monsters. But oftentimes, in order to understand them better, you have to kind of strip away the literary and cinematic elements. Because without Phil, all of these kinds of creatures have a have an anthropological, folkloric, mythological context that they they begin in. So their their origins lie along those lines. But because they lie along those lines, if they're recorded in in culture in, in tradition then that that lends the possibility that there's you know that they're real that these were things that that uh, were experienced not just once but numerous times and recorded in oral tradition first uh, in in the mythologies of prehistoric and early antique peoples and then written down in a literary fashion once writing became in vogue Uh, take the vampire for instance we usually think of, of vampires within the context of whatever whatever pop culture we live in and for for this generation, it's it's the Twilight vampires, or it's the the Vampire Diary vampires, or the True Blood va- True Blood vampires. Or it could be Brad Pitt, right? Interview with the vampire. Or interview with the vampire. Yeah. If you really like a good and a real attractive vampire, that might be your thing. Yeah. Hey, that's what we can call this episode: interview with a vampire expert. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's uh, that's a uh, prime meme material, right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it is. Luke, it, Luke is no, Doctor Meme, by the uh, way. Doctor no, me, you are. This is ridiculous. <laughs> no, but Judd, I think this isn't this isn't too far away from what we were talking about uh, with giants. We were talking about mythology and the, the, these things lived in the oral tradition. I, it's hard to say. And the vampire and the werewolf and, and these these things that go bump in the night, they haven't ever lost their their steam per se, at least in our traditions. You know, from whether it be ancient times to now, and so how did that start, and where does it, why does it still relevant today? And did these things, did these things exist at one point, or or do they still exist? The reason I I studied uh, neo pagans, I could have gone one of two routes. I could have gone the anthropological route, which I did, or I could have done a, a masters in classics, which I essentially already had the language training for anyway, because I'd done Greek and Latin, a little bit of Latin, but mainly Greek at that point. I wanted to study mythology in a I couldn't do it in a laboratory setting but the closest I, I could do were you had actual people that were thinking mythologically and acting upon it uh, was to study peoples that were embracing mythological traditions and trying to re revitalize what would be the the, the term uh, used in anthropological literature and so I chose to to do the best that I could and 
short of taking a time machine, this was the closest thing that I, I could get in actually studying mythology in a classical and ancient mythology specifically, since most of those traditions are based on those in a real time setting. As to the, the second point, certainly the the idea of these creatures has been around with us for a long time, but the fact or the rather the notion that they existed in real time and space, I think is events not only by the the breadth of, of folkloric and historical accounts, but also by by the apocryphal literature that's associated with the the Bible. So they, they talk about those things. Yeah. You know, and I think to understand these creatures, whether it's vampires or werewolves or, or ghouls or revenants or, or basically any kind of, of folkloric monster, most people agree that the, these things aren't kind. You know, they're not benevolent. They don't have your best interest at heart. And I think a lot of them can be traced back to the the pre-flood world uh, as described in the Book of Enoch. It, it's been established linguistically that the demons of the, the biblical world, the Old Testament and New Testament world, were the disembodied spirits of the giants, the Nephilim, that were destroyed in the flood. Well, if you look at the character traits, they were violent, they hated humanity, they consumed all the resources of humanity when they ran out they started actually killing people and drinking their blood they warred against each other killed each other and drank each other's blood uh and so you know as far as the vampire is concerned the origins of the vampire can be traced back to this the demons uh who exhibited these kinds of behaviors to begin with uh the fact of the matter that they lost their physicality didn't mean in any stretch of the imagination that they stopped being the things that they were before the flood. They were still as violent and voracious and evil and wicked as they were before the flood. It's just now they had, with with the increasing diversity of cultures and ethnicities in the world after the flood, you had different cultural niches that could be exploited by these demons. And so they began to fashion themselves into vampires. That's why we see variations of the vampire and other were creatures uh, all across the globe. You know, you can spin the globe and stop it, and you're going to find a culture that has a creature like a vampire, or werewolf, fill in the blank. What do you think about blood specifically? What is the magic of the blood? Because it goes all the way to Christ's blood, to these giants drinking blood. What is the what is the obsession with blood there? Well, the the sacrality of blood is is well attested in world religions. In fact, you don't even have to go very any farther than the, the Old Testament to find out that a blood was sacred. You know, there's the, the passage in Leviticus that says the blood is in the life, you know, for prohibitions against drinking blood uh, in the Old Testament. That, there's a reason for that because apparently there is not only, it's not only life sustaining physically, but there's a supernatural component to blood. Uh, and that's why blood became so important in bloodletting rituals and, and human sacrifice because of the, uh, the, innately understood sacrality of blood is that yeah if this this red liquid drains completely out of your body you're going to die and because of the the religious consciousness that had developed uh, or, or you could argue was actually hardwired into humans this understanding of the supernatural quality of blood was there as well and in the case of the vampire you can you can really think of the vampire as a, an awful parody of what Christ offers. You know, the vampire takes blood. Christ gave blood. The motivations uh, and character makeup are completely anathema to what you see in the person of Jesus Christ. It's like an antithesis. So you have... It is very much an antithesis. And I've heard the same thing goes for the werewolf, like where you have Jesus is considered the lamb, and then you have the wolf going after the lamb, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. So you have death to life, life to death, drinking the blood, shedding the blood... It's just, it's just like the opposite, right? And it makes me think about like all the symbolism of sheep, goats in the Bible. I'm sure ancient people probably, or even Native Americans, or some of these types of people thought wolves might be evil in essence. Like just the wolf is an evil, is an evil animal or how, how far do you take this thinking? Well, in terms of, of the werewolf and were, were creatures in general, you know, an ar- argument for their origins in the pre-flood world can be made as well because uh, in our, our past conversations on this show we've talked about the manipulation of animal and human genomes and you have all these chimera that are created 
in the pre-flood world. And certainly, you know, you know, a werewolf would fall under that category. It is a, a, a chimera. Your other question intrigues me about the the how people thought about wolves, particularly pastoralists, you know, people who kept herds of animals. It reminds me of the Lupercal that the uh, the Romans celebrated. Uh, Lupercal was celebrated on uh, February the, the 15th, the worship of Pan. Essentially, Pan was the god of the Lupercal. But one of the, the purposes behind the, the number of rather bizarre rites was to not just keep flocks safe from wolves but to keep them safe from werewolves really yeah the romans believed in these things too and it was an integral there's several books uh on on roman history Uh, cornell is one forsyth is another who talks about these werewolf creatures i think tp wiseman who wrote a, a excellent article about the lupercalia i think he also briefly references that but it's it's well attested in the book and of course the the wolf as a sort of totemic element in roman culture had been there since the beginning because you know one of the most iconic images in uh uh, roman culture was the she-wolf the capitoline wolf nursing romulus and remus the, the mythological founders of rome it's an icon that's found throughout the roman world and you know there were there were legions in the Roman army used the the wolf as an emblem. But specifically, the werewolf though was coming in and attacking. Is it running on two legs, or is that that kind of werewolf? Uh, uh presumably. You know they they wouldn't have thought of them as as having human characteristics if they. Well, I mean that's the modern modern accounts of the dog man. Yeah, they're yeah that they're capable of both quadrupedalism and bipedalism. So yeah, but that, I mean that was a revelation to me because by the time I learned that about the Lupercalia, which I had studied before then, but I had never heard before I took this seminar on Roman history, yeah, or Roman religion rather, that 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 was even a component that the pastoralists in the the Roman world feared these these werewolf creatures taking their flocks. And there's a lot of uh, reports of like like wasn't uh, Montague Summers a uh, a priest and he wrote a book on vampires? Uh, yes, yeah, I actually wrote a book on werewolves too. Uh, <laughs> Montague Summers was a, an amazing intellect. Um, he was a kind of a, 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 he was an eccentric clergyman. Most of the books he wrote about were on occult topics. Um, he wrote. Uh, a couple of books on vampires the vampires kith and kin for anybody who's interested in this if you're inter- if you're seriously interested in in examining evidences and the corpus of information that's out there one of the best books that you can read even to this day because it stood the test of time is the vampire his kith and kin uh, the sequel to that the vampire in europe is also an excellent work uh, both by montague summers but this this guy could not only access and make sense of the more recent and the folkloric elements, but he had the language training to examine the ancient stuff. Uh, you know, the Hebrew, the Mesopotamian, the, the Greek, the Roman, the bibliography, the the citations in, in his works take up a good chunk. I mean, you know, probably a good sixth of the book is the account of where all this source material was that he was accessing from. It's just, it, for the bibliographical information alone, these books are worth the investment. And he's, I see, like, sur- uh, surmising accounts of people having with these creatures, like actual accounts, or is it just the history of them? It sounds like he's like the, the Jeff Meldrum of Sasquatch for vampires and werewolves. He really kind of is. You know, he, 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 did, he didn't articulate it as such, but he really pioneered the field of what you could call vampirology. There have been other people who have, have sort of taken up the mantle uh, Bishop Sean Manchester is another fellow who's also a, a he, he's a, a, a priest in the um, autocephalic Catholic Church and also a, a well-read and I- interesting fellow you know Summers he struck the he struck the emblem the the coin if you will uh, for the the field of vampirology and really set the the pace for it and it was actually by reading his work uh, because of his allusions to the apocryphal material and tying the the vampire to the the demonic world, that I begin to consider, you know, what about these other creatures, you know, like werewolves and revenants and 
the, the same thing has to apply to them. And so the reason I bring up him is because I think sometimes when you're talking about this space, you need someone who bring credibility to the subject, right? Yeah. And a lot of times if you're just, <laughs> you know, you're like a girl who writes teenage vampire novels, obviously right. this isn't what we're talking about here. We're talking right. about a really well-respected priest uh, who's really, really educated talking about these creatures. And I think a lot of people just think, oh, this is Twilight. We're talking about some teen teen romance movie. Yeah, I, and i've I've had I've had some rather heated discussions with with Christians in particular who are adamant about you know well, I like Twilight, but vampires don't exist. There's no way that vampires could exist. The Bible doesn't talk about vampires, and I'm like, really? What Bible are you reading? I mean, some of the vampires of the ancient world are referenced by name in the Bible, such like Lilith is mentioned by name in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 34. <clears throat> some of these other bloodthirst, bloodthirsty entities are also referenced not only in the Old Testament, but also in uh, the apocryphal literature that's associated with uh, the Hebrew Bible. Are there any stories you can recount of these creatures, like true stories? Uh, well, th there's some interesting. I, I did a, a one of the programs I have on my YouTube channel is called Sunday School X, and it, it's sort of like Sunday School meets the X Files. And I, I deal with these kind of per peripheral questions. And I did one on on actually did a couple of videos on vampires, and uh, I look at uh, the precedent for them in the ancient world. So these are people that are actually writing down mythological and folkloric uh, accounts of vampires. There was the Lamashtu in Mesopotamia. Like so many of these words that we have in Mesopotamian languages, we, we sort of have to backtrack them from their Akkadian to the to the Sumerians. So the Sumerians were actually, they came up with this word. It was given, you know, it, you know, the, the Akkadians borrowed it, and then later Mesopotamian civilizations borrowed it. But they all knew what this Lamashtu thing was, this blood-drinking uh, demon. And there were other blood-drinking demons from the Mesopotamian world. I mentioned Lilith a moment ago. Uh, he shows up in uh, Mesopotamian literature as uh, Lilith or Lalitu. She's described as a blood-drinking demon. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, she became the queen of demons, and her her sustenance was not just any blood, but it was the blood of of infants that were sleeping in their cribs. Jeez, there's a lot of activity where people talk about the stuff like going on on Epstein's island doing this stuff, right? Yeah, so it's still going on today, basically. Yeah, any, any sort of of a blood ritual by definition is vampiric. I mean, there are people that are literally consuming blood claiming probably legitimately that it does you know that it empowers them we already know that uh athletes that, that blood dope you know they get this oxygen rich blood and get transfusions of it they improve their oxygen capacity their their ability to perform right. at, at high levels Lance Armstrong yeah exactly, exactly. that's exactly EPO. why why he did it so he could you know when he got to the the higher elevations you know he'd be able to handle and he flew by you know, all, all these other people because he was blood doping. So there, there's not the religious supernatural component that people might brush aside as woo woo, but there's a scientific precedent, you know, for this, that it actually does empower. Yeah. Well, they take, they take the the blood of young mice and put it in old mice and then the young yeah. old mice get young again. You know, they have, they start aging in reverse. It's been completely secularized, but the, the cult of Molech still exists in this country. I mean, we we have butchered so many innocent uh, individuals under the auspices of, of abortion. That's the largest blood right uh, that's ever existed in the, the, the history of humanity. And it's just a continuation of what the ancient Canaanites were doing by offering their, their infants to Molech or what the Maya were doing by throwing their their children into the cenotes uh, that they thought were openings into the underworld. Wow. V vampirism in all, all of its forms, whether it's, it's the emulation of vampirism by occultists or Luciferians or whatever, or the actual presence of a, a vampiric demon. Vampirism is still very much alive in this world. It's just that we're culturally conditioned to discount them almost immediately because they're, they're so prolific in our, our literature and our film and TV and whatnot. So they're not, they're not human. They're, do they take on human form? Cause like, you know, we see dog, there's dog men sightings all the time. Um, Sasquatch sightings. We see these sightings. They're reported. 
Is there vampire sightings where like, um, is there some sort of physical character traits that they have that, that we can say that we had modern sightings of these things or anything like that? Well, it, that's not to say that vampires couldn't appear as humans. Remember if, if, if these demons retain any of the knowledge of the, of the watchers, they're able to manipulate matter to varying degrees. The possibilities at least exist there, and that might go a long way towards explaining why vampires crop up returning as uh, family members. You know, people recognize them. That's certainly prevalent in a, uh, a lot of the accounts in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. You know, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there there were people that were doing ki- were killing people they thought were vampires, and and the, yes, and- exactly. You know, and I, I I have a story about that. When that story came out, I did an analysis of it. Went back and looked at it this this year, as a matter of fact, and I, I retweeted the story because the story I found was a really good anthropological analysis of what was going on. There were people in several sub-Saharan African countries who were killing not only people that they thought were vampires, but that they also thought were witches. Um, mm-hmm. th- these beliefs are still very prevalent uh, in many countries, and so, even countries that have industrialized. Uh, those beliefs are still very prevalent. But Twitter took my retweet of that story down. Really? Yeah. I, I suspect because it, whatever algorithm was at, at work, they thought it was a disparagement of African people, given oh. given our political climate right now. What specific story? Was it the one in uh, Malawi? Yes. Yeah. That's the one I was looking at, 2017. Yep. These mobs of people mm-hmm. beat up, killed people that they thought were vampires and responsible for these attacks that were going on. Yeah. And this is mo- this is modern day. This isn't, which is, is crazy, but also when you think about the level to which spirituality and witchcraft still exist in these countries as, as tenants and central beliefs belief systems mm. like it is in like it is in haiti as well you start to realize that, that there's a man there's a lot of crazy stuff that you know can be behind this is some of these what we call portals or the, or some of these these places where these things are invited in mm-hmm. I, I mean i think i think it's wild and I, so on the vampire thing as well like obviously 1897 dracula comes out it's it's loosely based on vlad the impaler Bram Stoker basically sold, you know, stole a bunch of that stuff from from the story of Vlad the Impaler. But historically, this myth is and, and these and these stories have continued with silver bullets and these things are pale. They can't look in mirrors. They have red eyes, and it seems like when we were talking about giants and on previous episodes and finding these stories, like even the flood narrative and the flood epic, were a lot the same in different places. These these are a lot of the same stories from different people groups that have the same attributes. Mm-hmm. And when we were talking about myth and the way that 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 works and leading credence to you know, the truth behind the myth and and the and the real story before literacy, do these things? I mean, you think these things still pop up and roam around in you know in twenty twenty? Yeah, certainly I do. Uh, you know, the component of, of wanting to, to dwell in flesh again of these disembodied spirits, you know, explains why people are are demonized or possessed or whatever appellation you, you want to attach to it. And clearly, I think we've all been around people who just sort of like, it's just draining to be around them. You just feel like you're, you know, they may not be taking blood, but they're, they're sucking the life out of you. You know, you mm-hmm. just... So there, there's that level, but there's also the the sort of you know these Luciferians that are clearly demonized. They've got, they have a an insatiable bloodlust. The stuff that's come out with like Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein, and, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, a lot of the the human trafficking that goes on is not just not just for sex, but it's also for killing these these children in in these bloodletting rituals. And people who have, were groomed or raised in satanic, you know, Luciferian backgrounds and have gotten out of it have all attested to the fact that this is the case. In fact, a, a good colleague, a good buddy of mine, Dr. Greg Reed, was raised in California uh, under these conditions. And by the grace of God, he, he was able to break out of it. You know, he'll tell you right off the bat, this stuff goes on behind, behind closed doors. And so, yeah, vampirism is still prevalent. It's just that we have to... We have to strip the cinematic and the literary vampire with his cape and cloak and uh, widow's peak hairdo. We've got, we've got to take all that stuff away from it. But there, there are other things, you know, you, you, you reference witchcraft. I lived in South Texas for 10 years 
And culturally, South Texas is basically northern Mexico. There's still a lot of brujeria and, and curanderismo. There's still a lot of these, these witchcraft traditions that exist in that part of the world. And I, I had students, some of my best students, come and tell me stories uh, from the old country, basically. One of them, whose uncle was a lawyer, he related a number of stories about one of the common themes in, in witchcraft in the American Southwest is that the witches were shapeshifters. Uh, and amongst other things, they could travel as fireballs through the sky. And he related a story of his uncle being involved in uh, a dispatchment of witches. There was an evening where they, they saw these fireballs flying over their, their property. And they did it night after night until the people uh, instituted a, an apotropaic, you know, a repellent against these witches. And what they did is they, they laid crosses down on the ground and put nails where the hands and feet would be. Hmm. And in the morning, they found these, these old women nailed to these crosses, nailed to these crosses, nailed to these crosses. Whoa, like rat traps? Yeah. That's wild. Wait, wait, wait. So Yeah, these were these are supernatural rat traps, basically. Wow. That's crazy. This this caliber of story I heard was some frequency. You know, I've heard many stories about people going out and their livestock being dead and completely drained of blood. They're like dead on the ground, no blood in them. Have you heard these stories? Oh yeah. Yeah. So something came at night, killed them, drank all their blood, left. Yeah. And that's modern day. That's the closest thing I've heard to like a Sasquatch sighting that you could like some empirical evidence or whatever to say what something, some vampire like well, creature. The chupacabra, right? Yeah. Like that's what they believe that that's part of what happened. Yeah. I want to I want to get back to the to the werewolf, though, because I know Nate has you've had your own personal experience. And, you know, this has lots of different names. We talked about the Beast of Bray Road is a real famous one that it was reported in 1936 and then in the 90s outside of Elkhorn, Wisconsin. Mm hmm supposedly a a werewolf um but nate you've got a story and, I, and we know we talked about this off before we started recording that you've had your own encounter and i guess it just wasn't it wasn't a hairy uncle it was uh <laughs> i told luke a little bit about this uh jed but when i was a kid i was about seven years old i lived in northern california right near american river that went all the way up to the mountains and the foothills we lived about a mile and a half from that river. That's the only thing that I can think of to give you some some context of how this could have happened. But my, I used to stay up late and watch like Nick at Night reruns. Um, you rebel, you rebel, you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like six or seven, so I watched like Andy Griffith and all that stuff, and it oh, was yeah. just I never got tired. But they would open the windows and doors at night in Northern California because it cools off, right? Yeah, it's not like the South where it's just hot all the time. So one night, I'm getting up from the couch, and I'm walking. It's like a long, kind of narrow part of the house. I'm, walk, I'm walking from the family room through the dining room, and there's a, a den that goes out to a screen door. I'm walking by, and something was just like, I just felt this don't look left. And I, you know, I did, obviously. I look out the window, and in the window is the face of a werewolf looking at me and I was the youngest of four children. So it wasn't like I was the kid who was the oldest and could make up stories and get my youngest siblings to believe. My sister was eight years older than me. I stop and I look at this thing and I, and I double taked and I, I swear it had, it was like grinning at me and it looked like pure evil. And I screamed and I ran into my parents' room and said, I saw a werewolf. I saw and And, and right away I'm, I'm so, I'm still young enough to think I must've made this up. And it wasn't until years later remodeling my first house when I started listening to these podcasts about people seeing this creature over and over again when I stopped and I was like, oh my, I didn't make that up. So here's how I know I think it happened. Because from the time I was about six or seven till I was about 12, I would run from the couch to the kitchen and I wouldn't look out the door. I was traumatized. I had PTSD with it. Yeah. It's hard because I was just young enough to, to, to tell myself it didn't happen. Like I made it up, but I also was like, who was I trying to convince? Like no one would believe me. Right. Right. I remember, I remember that sinister look like some pure out of pure hell. Wow.
Yeah, I mean, you, you don't have to convince me. Uh, you know, I mean, the, <laughs> the precedent, you know, is already there in world fo- folklore and the historical record. These things prey on, on fear, too. My brother had an experience not dissimilar to that when he was very little. He was he was three. You know, he was he was in his bed, and one night he he, he felt something kicking underneath his bed, like it, something was under there pushing the mattress up. He looked down, and of course he's a little kid. So the way he described it was, it looked like an evil Kermit the Frog. It had red eyes. It had had the sh- you know this kind of reptilian amphibian shape to it three-year-old is he's sitting there saying you know kermit why are you doing this why are you trying to scare me and he he was traumatized by it for a while so yeah that because these things are demonic in their root they they live off of fear they feed on fear it goes a long long way towards explaining why this thing was grinning at you like it was like you were its next That's meal crazy well I, yeah i mean it 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 um it, this was right around when Stephen King's Silver Bullet movie came out, right? I, I remember that movie. It had uh, uh, Everett McGill and uh, Corey Haim, I think was in it. Yes, yes. Yeah. And he was like this kid, and this thing breaks into their cabin or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I, so I always thought I just made it up. I thought, oh, yeah, I was just a kid. I had an imagination, and it didn't happen. And then years later, I'm like, whoa, like people today are still describing the dog man seeing him all over the place mm-hmm. it's weird that it chooses a wolf a dog why 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 the wolf why not any other creature the werewolf tends to be prevalent in the the west in the americas because i mean that's where you find large populations of wolves to begin with but in other parts of the world you have other were creatures you know there are were hyenas were jaguars and things like that you know the, the olmec actually worshiped a, a were jaguar interesting i mean there was a lot of there's a lot of stories out of post renaissance france or in germany as well with oh the my yes where they had yeah. they had a lot of werewolves and similar yes and and it's interesting that you bring that up because it coincides with the witch craze in early modern europe that took place in yeah. the 1500s and 1600s and, and you often find those accounts you know n- not universally but it's not uncommon to find them in conjunction with some sort of witchcraft that's that's not to say that ev- every witch turned in by a witch finder general was necessarily you know Somebody who had made some Faustian pact. There were lots of innocent right. people that were killed, particularly in Germany. You know, there there weather, weather witchers and uh, people that were still worshiping ver- versions of the old Norse gods. You know, that stuff was still prevalent in the the hinterlands and the back country in uh, German speaking regions of Europe. As to France, yeah, there are nu- numerous accounts of werewolfism. The one that sticks out in my mind and is probably the most curious and perhaps even the most well attested is the the Beast of Gévaudan about the the werewolf sightings and, and killings in uh, southern France. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was even a, a a movie that was partially on the legend. They used the legend as a, a sort of backdrop for the story. But if you guys remember the Brotherhood of the Wolf, uh, that French film that came out about 2002, uh, used the the tale of the Beast of Gévaudan as as a backdrop for that. But it was a, a series of killings that took place that had been uh, ascribed to this werewolf creature uh, that was scouring the country in uh, uh, southern France. Didn't they have a hunt for this thing with like a silver silver bullets and all the yeah. other things they needed? To- yeah, all of the the classical apotropaics were used. Yeah. Uh, and what's the deal with like the wooden stake and the the cross and the garlic and the silver bullets? Well, and- some of the some of the methods used for dispatchment are are more folkloric and tied ethnically to the the natural environs of a given culture. Some of them come out of Judeo Christian tradition. Let's take garlic first, you know, garlic being one of the classical repellents for uh, vampires. Well, we know now, and certainly ancient peoples knew, that garlic was good for your your health, is good for your cardiovascular system. Like, it, it can actually, if you take enough of it, it actually... It can actually do the same thing that statins do for clearing excess, you know, triglycerides and cholesterol and stuff like that out of your system. So it has a direct impact on the health of your blood. And the fact that ancient peoples used that as far back as the the Egyptians used it to try and repel evil spirits. The fact that it was used in antiquity 
is not only a food source, but also an apotropaic. Speaks volumes about why it would be used against these, you know, vampiric creatures. In the case of steaks, there are a number of kinds of, you know, of course, the one of the classic dispatchments in Eastern Europe for a vampire was the actual uh, impalation of, of the vampire. Whether they're a vampire or not, you shove a stake through somebody's chest, that's going to that's gonna end their activity really quick. But the, <laughs> what's in, always been interesting to me are the kinds of woods that were used to make these stakes, uh, like the hawthorn and uh, uh, in particular the aspen or the um, poplar. The poplar is thought to have been the wood that was used to make the cross. And it's why poplar family trees like the aspens, you know, if you see wind blowing through an aspen, it looks like it looks like it's alive. It looks like it's trembling. And that's where the Latin name for the tree, aspen, pop, uh, popular tremulous, comes from because it's supposedly trembling in shame because its wood was used to make the cross. And so there's a kind of... of hmm religious tie-in with the usage of poplar woods to make stakes. I, as for silver, I've heard a number of arguments. One is that, uh, again, uh, just as uh, like we know today that, that silver has antimicrobial properties. Like it can be used as a, a, an antibiotic in small doses, especially the, the colloidal silver. The yeah, atomized yeah. silver. I mean, it's uh, people knew this in antiquity. I mean, it's it's why they made uh, silverware. You know, silverware originally was really, you know, it really was silver. It's why they ate off of silver plates is because uh, they knew that, that this stuff had antimicrobial properties. And you know what they say about the full moon is that the, the microbes in your body double on the full moon. Yes. And you're actually, the, par- the parasites in your guts are, are churning much of why people can't sleep on the full moon. Because Yes. And we've actually got another full moon coming on uh, October 31st, if I'm not mistaken. Well, Nate, don't look out your window. Uh, <laughs> Good gosh. I mean, if this stuff doesn't convert you, I don't know what will. Yeah. What other kind of stories of like putting out, I mean, the fact you can put out crosses on the ground and you wake up with people on them. That's nuts. What other what other legendary stories do you have for us in that in that vein to to showcase? This isn't just something that we're we're making up. One of the most famous cases of of witchcraft, the Luciferian killings. Oh yeah, in Matamoros, which is a town just across the border from uh, Brownsville, Texas. The surface story was that this guy was practicing Santeria, which is a kind of syncretistic religion akin to uh, voodoo or condomble in, in Brazil. But the iconography in the place was clearly, it was also Luciferian. And that, that's the danger in a lot of solitary witches is that they'll mix and match. It's it's self-styled. It's been my experience that that speaks of direct tutelage from a demon. Wow. And I, I write about that in a chapter in my book on Interview with the Giant, but which people can reference. Um, but the Matamoros incident is, is really dark because it, it brings to the fore not only witchcraft, but it also brings to the fore the emulation of vampirism because these were blood rituals that were taken. I mean, there's three college students that were killed in the rituals they just crossed the border to have a good time and got picked up now now those kinds of kidnappings still still take place and probably with more frequency that's why the state department has issued a lot of prohibitions or or cautions against you know people crossing the border into northern mexico in particular gosh i remember when i was in college people used to go down to tijuana girls college girls get drunk on the weekends from slow did i went to tj Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, safe, it was safe then. Oh yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe when you're this, six five and you look like a Hulk Hogan. No, it was like mm-hmm. 2002, maybe. This is ages. I'm ago. talking like two or three girls would drive down. No, get, that's just dumb. Cash, I'm I'm six two, two two thirty. I'm not even gonna do that. What are some other? And this brings up an interesting point. There's a lot of people who just go through life and they're just neutral. They don't think this evil exists. What are some stupid things that people do to make themselves susceptible? to this stuff where like like a Ouija boards and is the first thing to think people think about where you're just you're just being a dummy you're basically giving the keys to someone to just take over well I, I that was the first one that popped to mind is the, the Ouija board uh, and, and in general any attempt to try and contact you know the dead the problem there is that yeah people people are contacting the dead but they're not contacting the dead that they think that they think they are. There's one tribe of, of giants called the Rephaim 
and that name is generally translated as the the either the frighteners or the the shades or the dead ones uh and etymologically this goes back to that that first part of the name roth remember there aren't any vowels in in these ancient semitic languages that name shows up in in phoenician ugaritic literature about their mythology it also shows up in mesopotamia in fact it's a, a word that's associated with the underworld in both of those cultures, the, in Mesopotamia and in, oh. in Phoenician Canaanite religion. It, it, it was a place where the Mesopotamians thought that their their revered dead ancestor kings went to. There are all kinds of associations with uh, with other creatures in Mesopotamian mythology, like the Apkalu and the, the Anunnaki. But th- that name is even re- retained not only in the tribal name of the, the Rephaim, in the Levant, but in names like Hammurabi, that middle section of his name is, is an homage to these entities that live in the underworld. Rop is also mentioned, or the Rop is mentioned in uh, the Ugaritic literature as well, the, the stories about their mythology. So these people are, are under the auspices of spiritualism and mediumship. They are contacting, quote unquote, the dead, but they're not the dead that they think they are because there's a lot of nefarious theater going on in the spirit world to get people to make themselves susceptible. And whether it's a Ouija board or scrying or any kind of divination or like that, there's a reason why these practices were prohibited in the Old and New Testament. Not just, It wasn't to, to thwart your curiosity about the supernatural, is that they were genuinely dangerous, that you imperiled your very being by accessing this world. And hmm. so, hmm. you know, yeah. that in, in, its, in its modern forms, whether it's, you know, again, scrying or looking, you know, looking into mirrors or divination or, or Ouija boards or whatever. Uh, it's just that Ouija boards are so easy because you can, you just buy them like you would a board game. Yeah. I've heard stories of that people trying to burn them and throw them away and they come back and they're in the closet the next day. Yeah. And there's like all these stories. Yeah. And I remember my sister was like, she came home one time. She was, she was older than me. Obviously I talked about that on this episode where they played light as a feather and bloody Mary and these games where they would try to lift people. And they, it's, there was a, a lot of creepy stuff in the eighties when we were kids. And I don't know if that stuff still goes on today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Some people are just, it's like they're driving drunk all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, sometimes you can drive home drunk, but eventually it's going to kill you, right? Right. Yeah, it's a law of averages kind of thing. I mean, you, you can't you can't beat the odds. You know, your, your first experience, your, or even a string of experiences of them might be completely innocuous, but how, how are you going to predict medium session or, or that pl- playing of the Ouija board and you, you let one of these ancient malevolent entities into your life um what what about the weirder stories like people have like toys that get possessed like i've heard so many stories of like dolls walking around or like little doll houses where like i heard this one story about these dolls or or they were reenacting murder scenes and they would come back to their house and they would look in their dollhouse and they're like strangling and trying to kill each other and i'm in a just some creepy stories like what what's like what lets those in well how do you how does a dollhouse get possessed how does that how does that even happen the same way that you know for millennia items and artifacts and and totems and things like that have been infused with spiritual energy it wasn't the idol itself it was whatever inhabited the idol right yeah, that's a that's an excellent example is that you know I, idols in the ancient world worked as these they worked as these conduits mm-hmm. you know because so so much of the worship attention and energy was focused on these idols that there was a connection made between the spirits that would use them and dwell them or you know again however you want to contextualize that Uh, by that same token you know physical things inanimate things can can be occupied and i and i bring that up because a lot of my friend modern day christians think that ancient people who wrote the bible were stupid because they did worship golden calves mm-hmm. and stuff like that. They're like, well, if you just read the Bible, those guys were dumb. So obviously a lot of the stuff they wrote wasn't based in any reality. Like you, you have to take what they wrote with a grain of salt when they talk about the gods and stuff. And I'm like, no, no, no. These idols were possessed. They weren't stupid in worshiping a, a pair of boots. Right. You know what I mean? They, there was something in the boots. Yeah. And it was seducing these cultures especially the Israelites to what to leave their wanderlust right like I, I want to go over here yeah and, yeah and when when you read that 
you know, that they built, they melted down all their the account in Exodus when they melted down all their gold and they made a golden calf, which I've heard anything from Apis to Hathor, you know, could have been the God. What sort of gets lost and would have been Im- implicit for the readership of an ancient audience that's not immediately evident to us. And again, this is a, this is why it's so important to, to un- understand the culture, the context, the anthropology of the biblical world is that in the in the process of melting all that gold down and building this idol up that was not just craftsmanship tradesmanship but it was ritual too ritual designed to do exactly what you're talking about to bring in these entities to indwell uh, during the during the ritual processes of whatever these people were were observing at the time that's wild yeah i mean how do you how do you protect yourself I mean, do you you carry garlic in your pockets? No. <laughs> that would just make everything more delicious. For one, one. It's not a bad idea. Of course, yeah. G- garlic, garlic makes everything better, right? Anyway, um, your first line of defense is your faith. There, if there's one thing that these things are scared of, uh, it's Jesus. It's, it's you know, mm-hmm. and that kind of sound. I know that that sounds like the Sunday school answer, but. That's the truth. I mean, I can't tell you how many accounts whether I've heard, whether it's of people who are being attacked by demons, they're trying to indwell them, or uh, I've even heard of people being attacked by Mothman, entities that claim to be extraterrestrials that have invaded, you know, the homes of people. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've heard people who have simply called out in prayer to Jesus at that time, even mentioning the name of Jesus and the whole, the whole experience dissipates. The things depart Hmm. because they're, they piss their pants. Yeah. They know what they're, I mean, I'm sorry to put it in in such, such crude terms, but that's how afraid (laughs) they are uh, of Jesus. That wasn't that crude. Could have gone way dirtier. (laughs) Yeah. You could have, you could have dooted your drawers. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, there's been several times in my life where I've had sleep paralysis mm-hmm. and I'm caught in, it feels like I'm caught in dimensions. Have you ever had that yeah. Luke where you're like half asleep, you can't move? Oh yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. I always wake up screaming the name Jesus. What is that? Are we, are we like crossing paths with these things? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, that uh, sleep paralysis used to be called the uh, old hag syndrome because people felt like, what they wrote off as a witch, you know, was, was like pressing down on them and wouldn't let them up. You know, they were just yeah. trying and trying to move, but they, they couldn't. And they were in mortal terror. So, yeah, I think that there's a spiritual component. There's a demonic component to it. It's a heaviness. Because, again, yeah, you, I mean, you have to you have to remember the strategy here, the, the MO of these things is not for our betterment. It's not to do things that help us, but to hurt us, you know. I mean, they literally are out to harm us, kill us, persuade us to their side if they can. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a, these kinds of experiences are examples of where their realm comes into contact with ours because they're always trying to get at us. They always want to be, they always want to indwell. How revolutionary would it be if you could haul off all agnostics and middle of the road folks to an exorcism and give them a firsthand experience with this stuff? What do you think their re- reaction would be and how would they feel? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think some people would duty their drawers. Well, yeah, I mean, I, there's some people <laughs> who would take take away from that experience, you know, you know, they'd be they'd be convinced, you know, at that point because they they themselves had experienced, you know, until you experience something it, it's often easy to to write something off, but I, I can't help but think that it, you know, even after, you know, experiencing something like that, they would they would still be looking for the naturalistic, you know, rationale for whatever had just happened. But these things are speaking dead languages and they're contorting bodies. I mean, those are the counts that got me going, wow, they must be the, they must be spirits of antiquity, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, like me, if you're a historian by trade or a paleographer or somebody who deals with ancient languages and epigrapher and you see and hear this stuff coming out of somebody, there's bafflement there. Especially if you're coming from a secular perspective, you know, you don't don't subscribe to a supernatural worldview. You're like your first inclination is to think, OK, well, at some point in time, this person was exposed to Aramaic or Akkadian or something like that. But 
when, when you find out the background of some of these people, you know, that they, they, they've never had Latin, they've never had Greek, they've never had Hebrew, they've never had, you know, fill in the blank. And it's, they're speaking this stuff with fluency. That ought to be an indicator to even the staunchest of scholar that something is at work here that is not within our, our materialistic explanation of the universe. And why that that isn't, isn't even considered as a possibility boggles my mind. But at the same time, I understand it because as, as we pointed out in, our, in the last discussion, the uh, objective truth has just been thro- thrown out the window. There's no... It's all relative. If we're, if we're, yeah, or it's all relative. If we're concerned with objective truth, then you know, it, no matter how fantastical it seems on the surface, we we need to at least consider it. And there isn't even a consideration uh, amongst uh, mainstream scholars, you know, about the supernatural reality of this thing, which does us no favors. Well, if vampires and werewolves are connected to the demons and these these spirits. You, you told us a couple stories of uh, your friend. You couldn't move your friend. What's another story of an exorcism or a demon extraction? Uh, well, it's it's a story that's actually connected with that same uh, incident. Um, the young man in question had cast spells on a, a, another f- friend of, of his, former friend anyway. <laughs> and that's how we found out about it is because my, my brother was friends with both of these guys. But the, the young man who had been demon-possessed cast a, basically a series of revenge spells against another person. And the spell was basically that he would have car trouble. And in the space of about a year, this kid had wrecked five cars after this spell was cast. You know, I knew that, that he had wrecked these cars because I kept asking my brother, what in the world? Why do they keep getting him a car if he can't, if he can't drive it straight on the road? And then after after this fellow told me all, all of this it began to make sense well halloween halloween huh be careful out there kids yeah <laughs> yeah don't screw around and the weird thing about being a parent is i remember when i was a kid we weren't allowed to watch the smurfs because all the witchcraft that was connected to the smurfs mm-hmm. um, plus they were communists <laughs> plus there was just I'm one serious. girl in the tribe it was a little weird uh, it was a little strange dude well i mean yeah. there is the there's a sort of campiness about about it all. I guess the superficial, you know, just sort of look at it as sort of poking fun or laughing at the devil. But I, I, even that, you know, is kind of dangerous in the end. And I, I just tell I tell people, you know, look, I, I can't make that decision for you. It's a decision you have to have to come to. The older I get, the the more the more distance from the imagery of Halloween that I, I put between myself, I, simply because of of all the things we know now about the roots of of Halloween and that it was associated with, you know, these agrarian festivals uh, that often did include human sacrifice. Why are we perpetuating the um, the imagery, you know, of the of those, you know, in the case of Halloween, which is largely based on the Celtic festival of Samhain, uh, although it finds its iter- iterations and variations in other parts of the world. It was specifically, th- you know, speaking of portals, it was specifically thought of as this time when the veil between this world and the spiritual world, the supernatural world, was thin, and, and these spirits and entities could be contacted. That should give us some pause, I think, on this side of the the of the issue. Yeah, it's a little crazy, man, that the the way that we commercialize and then and then some and then dumb down and you know uh, fluff up mm-hmm. some of these things that have roots in pretty gnarly evil stuff. For sure. I mean, that's really what it is. It's not that we have the people who are in the know have any magical powers. It's just that they're aware of the magic, mm. right? And so, you know, pull your head out of your ass, uh, uh, sorry, and look at the evidence and <laughs> realize you're in a cosmic war. Yeah. Right? Is that is that, it, And maybe go on a, a spiritual ride along. Go find some exorcist and. T- <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, go on a ride along yeah, think, and see the darkness, right? I think a lot of deliverance ministers are willing to, you know let people do that uh if they would just av- avail themselves of the possibility mm. well i think some people just need that kind of evidence they just need that kind of proof it's like that old saying if tommy boy you know like i could get a good look at a t-bone steak by sticking my head up a bull's ass <laughs> or just take the butcher's word for yeah it, exactly. so i could take i'll take the exorcist's word for it huh. right that this stuff's real it's out there but some people got to stick their head up the bull's ass and i think that if you got to do that i i would say maybe you have to do that 
right? Some people like have to go out and see this stuff yeah. firsthand before they they. they and I would, I would like to add in that blurry creatures in no way is liable uh, for any experiences. You know, right? <laughs> Since Nate's Nate's now encouraging <laughs> encouraging this, Just uh, saying that like it's real, yeah, right? Like sure. I don't know if exorcists do that, bring people with them, like a ride along, need somebody to hold them down. While the power of Christ compels them. That's right. We appreciate it. Thanks so much for coming yeah. on and uh, giving us a Thanks, little. Judge. Yeah, a um, little like guess. I said, my my, uh, I'm happy to do it. And uh, if people are interested, you know, they they can look into my books and find a lot of this stuff mm-hmm. by accessing my my website, burdenbeyond.com and tioba.org. I've got a new one that's going to be coming up this month called the Van Helsing way, which actually deals with a lot of the material we've been talking about the, the demonic origins of folkloric monsters. And, uh, within the next couple of days, I'll actually have a number of books out. I've got, um, there'll be one on witchcraft and one on, uh, my approach to studying the paranormal. All right. I'm going to pick those up. Well, you heard it here on blurry creatures. There are vampires and werewolves still running around out there. You know, say your prayers at night and, and, and take it seriously, I think. Absolutely. Check out Judd. Judd's got books coming out. Judd's been a fantastic guest. We'll have to bring him back again, yet again at some point. But check it out. I remember to hit the subscribe button. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. That's right. You bet. That's right. We'll keep, Thanks, bring, we'll keep bringing you the goods. Yep. Yep.